And so I'm going to bring you what I consider to be a treat. It is the story of the enlightenment of Yeshe Sogyal, the closest disciple of Padma Sambhava and the mother of Buddhism in Tibet. Yeshe Sogyal attained Buddhahood in one lifetime. Her life story is found in a Terma text. Terma means treasure. Terma texts are the texts that are believed to have been sealed and buried by Padmasambhava and his disciples in the 8th century in Tibet. Yeshe Sogyal is believed to have been an incarnation or emanation of the goddess Sarasvati. Nevertheless, she had to pass many tests and suffer greatly before she attained enlightenment. Yeshe means unending primordial wisdom. Sogyal means conqueress of the lake or victorious one of the ocean of wisdom. She was born the daughter of the ruler of one of Tibet's seven provinces. At her birth, there were many auspicious signs. By the time she was ten, she had matured to a beautiful woman. Tales of her beauty spread throughout Tibet and into China and Nepal. Hordes of suitors descended upon the kingdom. With them were two princes. Her father told her to choose between the two. She told them she did not want to be married to either. To go with either of these men would be to enter the prison of samsaric suffering from which it is so very difficult to escape. Her father sent her away. He declared that whichever prince found her first would have her. When the officers of one prince found her, she ran into the mountains, leaping across great boulders. At last, one officer caught her. He stripped and whipped her with a thorn whip, saying, you will yield to me or I will kill you. She answered, Lord Karchu may rule the steppes with great power, but he lacks even one day's inclination to achieve enlightenment. I would rather die than surrender and be his wife. After much whipping, she collapsed. Lying there bloody and in tears, she could think of no way to escape. So she sang this sad song to the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. I would entitle this the prayer of the world mother. It is a prayer you can give when you are in desperate circumstances. O oh, Buddhas of the Ten Directions, Bodhisattvas and protectors of beings, masters of great compassion and power, possessors of the wisdom eye and magical abilities, O oh, great-hearted ones, the time has come to show your mercy. My intention is good, like a precious jewel. It will become bad, worthless as stone, contaminated by the intentions of these alien demons. You who have power, please bring it forth now. In one lifetime, in one body, I can realize the highest dharma. But these alien demons will envelop me in the mire of samsara. You who have compassion, return me quickly to the path. Isn't this a wondrous prayer? <laughs> After Yesha Sogyal sang this song, the soldiers became drunk in celebration of having caught her. They fell asleep, and she was able to escape. She fled through valleys and mountain passes and hid in the wilderness, living on fruit and wearing cotton clothes. However, the other prince heard where she was and sent 300 men to look for her. Soon they found and captured her. When Prince Karchu heard of this, he determined to fight the second prince. They began raising armies. Tisong Detson heard of the conflict and settled it by making Yeshi his wife. Tisong Detson was a student of Padmasambhava. 
He was devoted to the practice of Buddhism and allowed Yeshe to study Buddhist teachings. In about AD 750, T. Song Detson had invited the precious guru to come to Tibet to overcome the forces of the entrenched Bon religion that were opposing the establishment of Buddhism by their black magic. Padmasambhava came to Tibet and stayed for 55 years. T. Song Detson was so eager to receive teaching from his guru that on one of Padmasambhava's visits, he offered him his entire kingdom, including his wives. Padmasambhava requested a woman committed to the Dharma to assist him in his practice of the secret teachings. The king gave him Yeshi Sogyal, who was then 16 years old. Padmasambhava took Yeshe to a retreat where he instructed and initiated her. Following a vision of the goddess Sarasvati, Yeshi found she had perfect recollection of everything she was taught. After she had successfully passed the initiations, she asked Padmasambhava for another. He told her that she was not yet ready. She needed a friend with whom to practice the esoteric teachings. He told her to seek out a young man named Acharya Sale, who was 17 years old and lived in Nepal. She set out for Nepal alone and on foot with no idea of where Acharya Sale was to be found. When she came to the city of Kokam Han, she saw a handsome young man. He walked up to her and said, Mother, where have you come from? Have you come to ransom me? He had been stolen from his family as a boy and was serving as a slave. His owners did not want to give him up. They asked for 500 ounces of gold, which Yeshe did not have. Then she heard of a wealthy family in the city whose 20-year-old son had just been killed. She went to them and offered to bring him back to life if they would give her the 500 ounces of gold. She healed him, and after calling to Padmasambhava, who can instantly dispel all evil obstacles to help her and send her his blessings. She freed Acharya Saleh and returned to Tibet with him, where she recounted her adventures to her guru. He said to her, Reviving those who have been killed and other such practices are just ordinary powers. <laughs> Do not harbor pride because of such things. He bade her practice meditation with Acharya Saleh. After a time, he told her she must go off alone and practice the eight great disciplines. And so Yeshe found a cave near the snow line and settled down to practice for one year, wearing only a cotton cloth. She had to learn to kindle the Tumo heat, an inner heat by which yogis raise the body temperature through breath control and visualization. At first, she did not succeed. Her whole body became covered with blisters from the cold, and sharp stabbing pains ran through her. Yeshe was near death when she prayed to her guru. Gradually, she felt the heat rise within her. Her body changed as completely as a snake losing its skin. After her food ran out, she lived on minerals and then began to live on air alone. She put aside even her cotton cloth and sat naked. She said, at first, bliss accompanied the coming and going of my breath. I had various kinds of clear and visionary experiences, but after a while, doubts assayed my mind. My breath became unstable. I could not control it. My throat became dry and rough. My nose and throat felt as if they were stuffed with cotton. My stomach gave me great pain. Once more, I came close to death. Again, she called to her guru. Padmasambhava appeared to her and chastised her. Listen well, daughter of the lineage. When you were the daughter of a king, you cared only for finery and pleasure and could bear no misfortune at all. Now is the time to be unconcerned 
Whether you meet happiness or misery on the path, whatever comes, suffering or great bliss, carry on. Padmasambhava told her, do not crave bliss. Be devoted, virtuous, and humble. Listen well, daughter of Karchen, how proud you were of following the Dharma, how crafty and deceitful you were before, before you were only a hypocrite. Now is the time to reject all artifice and sham. Do not hold back, but show your perseverance. Do not dwell on what you have done. Be devoted, virtuous, humble. He bade her use plant and herb essences to cleanse her awareness and restore her body. She then left the cave and went to the three lion lair caves of Bhutan. Eventually her body became as strong as a Vajra, diamond, and impervious to weapons. Her speech became clear and melodious. It sounds so soothing, it calmed even the proud tigress. Her mind entered a meditation like the indestructible Vajra. She next practiced the discipline of speech. She gave mantras without ceasing day and night. She recited the sacred scriptures by heart. At first her voice stammered. Her throat was torn so that great quantities of blood and pus frothed forth. She felt a searing pain in her esophagus and it became twisted, hard, and dry, swollen with blood and pus. Again, she came close to dying, but in the end, she overcame and developed all the 60 different fine qualities of voice. She continued to meditate in isolated caves. Regional gods and malignant spirits attacked her. First, they tempted her with all kinds of food. First temptation on the path, right? <laughs> then clothing, horses, and all sorts of worldly goods. But she overcame them by the power of her meditation. Next, the demons appeared as a group of attractive young men. They manifested themselves tangibly in the cave to tempt her. She described them as the kind of young men at whom a girl need only glance to feel excited. They tried to seduce her suggesting various acts of passion, trying to excite her. But she conquered them as well. Yeshe Sogyal said, overcome by the splendor of my samadhi, some of them vanished immediately. Some I reduced to petty frauds by insight into all appearances as illusion. By means of the bodhisattva's meditation that produces revulsion, I transformed some into black corpses some into bent and frail geriatrics, some into lepers, some into blind, deformed, dumb, or ugly creatures. And without exception, they all vanished. Demons often attempt to distract yogis in meditation. Mark Prophet gave the antidote for such temptations. He says, visualize the person or persons who are coming to you in a vibration of sensuality as being their bare skeleton. This will cure you of all desire. <laughs> if you are distracted by visions when you are meditating or decreeing, you can try Yeshi's techniques. But the demons were not finished yet. Now they threaten Yeshi with violence, earthquakes, thunder, lightning, weapons stabbing towards her, and packs of wild animals growling and showing their fangs. But said Yeshi Sogyal, according to a translation by Keith Dalman, from the assurance I had gained from abandoning attachment to my body and love of myself, arose compassion for all these beasts and they vanished. Do you understand why they vanished? When you love something as a manifestation of God, it disappears because it is God. In your mind, it is God. Therefore, it cannot be present in its lower or vicious or growling or angry state. 
And so when you truly love the seed of something that is God and love the manifestation of something because it consists of God's energy and you do so impersonally and without attachment, all of these things flee. So next she was attacked by a vast army of millions upon millions of worms, <laughs> insects, scorpions, snakes, and spiders. They swarmed over her, biting, stinging, and scratching. At first she was a little perturbed. <laughs> but then she sang, all phenomena are only tricks of the mind. I see nothing to fear in inner space. Isn't that a wonderful mantra to have when you're in a tight spot? All phenomena are only tricks of the mind. I see nothing to fear in inner space. She entered samadhi and all the insects vanished. She was God, she saw only God. The insects were a lower manifestation, a misuse of God's energy as the Ascended Masters teach. Therefore, they could not exist in her presence. Next, the demons manipulated the weather, causing lightning, fire, and hail. The Tibetan people decided it was Yeshi's fault and converged on her cave to kill her. She continued to meditate, sitting still, her gaze steady. They cried, demoness. They called her a demoness and began to shoot arrows at her and to stab her with knives. But they were unable to harm her. Since they had no effect on her, they went home. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, all the demons and spirits who had attacked her turned and pledged to serve her. After practicing the final discipline, Yeshe Sogyal attained the Vajra body, and it was prophesied that she would live 225 years. She was given the name Radiant Blue Light Master of Longevity, and she returned to her guru. Padmasambhava said to her, Wonderful yogini, practitioner of the secret teachings, the basis for realizing enlightenment is a human body. Male or female, there is no great difference. But if she develops the mind bent on enlightenment, the woman's body is better. He told her, now that you have achieved what you wanted for yourself, strive for the benefit of others. At the time, there were powerful factions in Tibet, including many of the king's own ministers and some of his wives. These opposed the spread of Buddhism. They belonged to the ancient Ban Shaman religion that practiced black magic and animal sacrifice and drank blood. The king himself was somewhat sympathetic to the Ban because he had family connections with them. The religion had a large following. Ordinary and simple-minded people were involved. The original reason King Tisong Detson had invited Padmasambhava to come to Tibet was that the Bon were practicing black magic to prevent Tisong Detson from building a great Buddhist monastery at Samye, just outside of Lhasa. Each night, demons would come and scatter all of the building materials. Padmasambhava came and exorcised the demons and then oversaw the completion of the monastery. But the battle with the Ban was not over. They still enjoyed a strong following among the Tibetan people. It was time for a showdown. The Ban shamans and Buddhists had come to Samye together to celebrate the end of the year. The Ban shamans made fun of the Buddhist statues and stupas. Referring to Padmasambhava, they said, some evil Indian has bewitched the king. They promised to perform a sacrifice in which they would show the king incredible power and miracles beyond belief. They slaughtered over 6,000 animals. Can you imagine a pile of 6,000 slaughtered animals? Stags, does, yaks, sheep, goats, horses, oxen, cows, mules, dogs, birds, and swine in many different ways. 
Then they chanted to invoke the Bon gods. The king and queens and ministers did not enjoy the spectacle. The Buddhist monks from India gave the king an ultimatum. If the Bon stay, we go. They said, fire and water can never meet as friends. You must send these allies of evil far away. At last, one of the king's ministers suggested a debate between the Buddhist monks and the Ban shamans. The minister said, if the Dharma is true, we will support the Dharma and destroy the Ban down to its roots. If the Ban is true, we will destroy the Dharma and follow the ways of the Ban. The debate was held on a great plain with many of the Tibetan people looking on. As the debate began, Padmasambhava appeared and sat in the air at about the height of a palm tree. First, they engaged in an exchange of riddles, which the Bon won. But the Buddhists said, they have won the contest in riddles, but riddles are not part of the Buddha's teaching. Then the debate began. The Buddhists explained their understanding of the scriptures. At first, the Bon were struck dumb and could not answer. Then they began a debate in earnest. The king gave each a white pebble for each valid statement and a black pebble for each inauthentic statement. The Buddhists received thousands of white pebbles while the Bon received thousands of black pebbles. <laughs> then it was time for the contestants to display their powers. The Buddhists displayed superiority here as well. One circled the earth in a moment, bringing back rocks from the ends of the earth as proof. One walked on the water. One ate rocks. <laughs> One called a tigress to come from far in the south, and she came. One sat cross-legged in the sky, and another flew in the air. The Tibetan people were converted to Buddhism. <laughs> Notwithstanding Padmasambhava's warning that none of this is really important. But the Bon were not about to admit defeat. They cast evil spells, killing nine monks. Yeshe Sogyal brought the monks back to life. Next, the Bon threatened to destroy Samye with thunderbolts. But Yeshe Sogyal caught the thunderbolts on the tip of her finger and threw them back to the land of the Ban, where they caused great devastation. The king decreed that the Ban shamans should be banished. At this, they threatened to destroy all Tibet by their spells. But Yeshe Sogyal practiced meditation for seven days, after which she received the power to make enemies their own executioners. She caused the Ban shaman spells to turn upon themselves so that eight of the nine most powerful Ban priests were killed. T. Song Detson banished the Ban shamans to Mongolia and burned their books. Training began for 12,500 Buddhist monks, and soon after, Buddhism spread throughout Tibet. Yeshe traveled far and wide, spreading the teaching. She trained thousands of monks and nuns. Many attained enlightenment, and a number became equal in power to herself. She worked with Padmasambhava for 11 years, during which time they were not separated. He revealed to her all his secret heart treasures. The text says, it was truly as if the contents of one vessel had been completely emptied into another leaving nothing behind. They traveled to many sacred places, hiding sacred terma texts. The text describes in elaborate detail how Yeshe Sogyal and the other disciples worked to transcribe the teaching, prepare the terma texts, and seal them for the future. Tibetans believe that there are still texts hidden throughout the land, waiting to be discovered by qualified persons. At last, Padmasambhava prepared to take his leave of earth. Yeshe pleaded with him to stay, but after giving his final teaching and many blessings, he mounted a winged white horse 
rose into the air, surrounded by a blaze of rainbow light, and vanished into the rays of the sun. According to tradition, he went to his paradise, or pure land. Yet he returned periodically to his beloved consort, Yeshe Sogyal, giving her advice and teachings. Yeshe began to practice compassion for all beings. There are many fantastic stories in the text. Some are meant to be symbolic of Yeshe's spiritual experiences. The text relates, she gave her body to wild animals, clothing to those who were cold and food to the hungry. To the sick she gave medicine, to the poor riches. To the powerless she gave protection, and to those with great desire she gave her own body. The god Indra sent spies to test her. First a man whose kneecaps had been taken out was brought to her. She allowed her kneecaps to be cut out and given to him. She gave other parts of her body to those who asked. Then Indra appeared and healed her. Next a leper came to her. His body was in a state of decomposition. He asked her to be his wife and live with him. She became his wife and served him faithfully. At last the leper turned into the god Nanda and praised her. She traveled over Tibet, completing her dharma. She gave teachings and trained monks, settled doctrinal disputes, practiced teachings, prayed, concealed terma texts, and transmitted the higher teachings to her closest disciples. She said, nowhere in Tibet could you find two handfuls of earth not blessed by me. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 800-323-5228. That's 800-323-5228. At the age of 211, Yeshi Sogyal prepared to take her leave of Tibet and go to the land of the Lotus Light to join Padmasambhava. Her students entreated her to stay. You are the place of refuge, Sogyal, the Nirmanakaya teacher. If your auspicious and revealing beauty disappears into space, whom can we turn to, ourselves and others like us, bereft of the Dharma? Stay a while longer and teach, mature and liberate us. Pray, hear us, wondrous Sogyal. She said to them, There is no such thing as meeting and parting. My power is such that I am free from karma and can lead others. I give, ref I give refuge without distinguishing self and other, and I manifest compassion. For me, the mother, there is no suffering from death or from change. No short time have I helped Tibet. A long time I have helped her. 211 years have passed. Well, have I not helped Tibet long enough? Aren't you grateful, all you gods and men? Friends, do not be unhappy. Practice earnestly and deeply. Meditate upon the actionless great perfection. There is no other way to transcend misery. Give instruction to all beings who are ready, but do not give it to those who are not ready. Meditate upon me with the intensity of a deity. Visualize me in your four root chakras. Strive for mantric energy in your speech. Those who enter the door of this secret teaching may develop great desire. Control this. Cast deceit and pride into the sea. Burn desire. Burn it with the fire of your mind's intensity. Throw profit, gain, and transgression to the winds. Let doubts and confusion disappear. 
Hold fast to the supreme dharma for your own good and help others without arrogance or pride. Through vision, meditation, and action, you will be freed. I am the master of all samsara and nirvana. If you know Yeshe Sogyal, you know she resides in the hearts of all beings and manifests in all realms and all sense fields and incarnates again and again. You know that we are inseparable. We always have been and always will be together. But if you do not know me, you are tied to outside appearances. The body formed of flesh and blood is a fetter and being inferior oppresses you. But if you meditate using the patterning and energy practices, you will have the means to wander through space. If you bring energy and mind under your own power, you will truly achieve what is called city. Though your mind is deceitful and fraught with the five poisons, though your life stream is naturally unsettled and your communication bound by ordinary conceptualization, they can be purified. She had one final message for her meditation partner, Ucharya Saleh. Together we practiced profound and secret teachings, and because of those blessings, I achieve liberation in this life. And yet, though you and I were intimate friends then, still, sometimes you had doubts, you wavered, you even scoffed at me. She told him that he would have to undergo 13 future rebirths and that he would meet with obstacles, gossip, abuse, and evil counsel. But in the end, he would be one with her and Padma Sambhava. At last, she began to withdraw from the physical octave. She said, listen, faithful Tibetans, I am merging with the fundamental the ground of all that is. Physical pain and suffering are disappearing. The conditioned Sogyal is expanding into the unconditioned, and all of the pain and agony of the body's constituents are disappearing. Even the illusion of a body is dissolving, and all needs for medicines for cures and bleeding are disappearing. The Holy Dharma has transformed my body into light. This bag of skin and pus and dark flesh is disappearing. The Mother Sogyal is disappearing into the primordial Ah. She need no longer cry out Ah in pain. This wild lady has done everything. Many times I have come and gone, but now no longer. I am a Tibetan wife sent back to her family. I shall now appear as the queen, the all good, the Dharmakaya. I have mourned many men of Tibet who have left me behind, but now I am the one who will go to the land of the Buddhas. Do not suffer needlessly depend on prayer. So Gyal will never depart from those who have devotion. Just call upon me and I will appear. Dear friends, just summon me and I will return. I wish the greatest happiness for you all. After this, a beautiful five-colored rainbow appeared. Within it was an exquisite deep blue light in the shape of a sesame seed. And Yeshe Sogyal disappeared within it. Four deities grasped it and drew it up into the sky, higher and higher until it disappeared. But that was not the last of the teaching. After the disciples had lamented for a time, a brilliant luminous radiance appeared and said, 
Listen, faithful Tibetans, I am the great Yeshe Sogyal Ma. The sentient beings of Tibet suffer endlessly, harmed by many and varied karmic actions. But your suffering is self-produced. Can't you see that? The three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, are the refuge place of sufferers. Pray to them one-pointedly with your whole being. Do not suffer needlessly. Be joyful. Next, she advised her students to recite the Sanskrit mantra that is called the Vajra Guru Mantra. The Ascended Masters call it the Golden Mantra. She said, recite the Vajra Guru Mantra, the essence of the essence of mantra. These 12 syllables are the very essence of Padma Sambhava. Recite them and you reverse samsaric proclivities. Samsara, as you know, is the indefinitely repeated cycles of birth, misery, and death caused by karma. Samsara is all worldly illusion. Thus, samsaric proclivities are those karmic tendencies, habit patterns, and thought patterns that we have wound around ourselves during our many lifetimes on earth. Yeshe continued, this mantra is the antidote. It is the antidote, the means to pass and reverse all misery. This mantra is the wish-fulfilling gem. You beings here now and you who are yet to come, please practice and rely upon the essential mantra. The voice stopped. The brilliant, luminous radiance disappeared into the southwest. That is the end of the story of Yeshi. Traditionally, Padmasambhava's mantra is invoked to create peace and harmony as the antidote for the confusion and turmoil of this dark age. Padmasambhava instructed Yeshi Sogyal that his mantra should be used to avert the evils of a coming period of great darkness. A Tibetan Terma text records the dialogue between himself and Yeshi. Yeshi Sogyal spoke, I see that there will come a time in the distant future. Remember, she is speaking in the 8th century, the 8th century, not very long ago. I see that there will come a time in the distant future when human beings will possess fickle intellects and ever-changing opinions, what we would call the time of the coming of the yin mind the unpredictable human consciousness. They will be very excitable, impatient, and excessively prone to violence. They will cling to heretical views regarding the Holy Dharma. In particular, they will slander and belittle the doctrine of the supremely secret mantras. At that time, for all sentient beings, the three great evils of disease, poverty, and warfare with terrifying weapons will greatly increase. In particular, there will come a time of terrible suffering for Tibet and the Tibetan people when the troubles, just as when a nest of ants is broken open, the ants swarm out, will spread with great devastation across the three regions of China, Tibet, and Central Asia. This prophecy of Yeshi is coming to fulfillment to the letter. In such evil times, it will be extremely difficult to avert or reverse those trends. In such times as those, O Guru, if one should rely solely on your sadhana, which is the Vajra Guru Mantra, what benefit and advantage shall come from this? 
Then the great master spoke, O faithful daughter, what you have said is very true. But in such future periods of time as those, it is still certain that from practice there shall come forth benefits, both immediate and ultimate, for all sentient beings. Guru Rinpoche said that if a monk or even a layman of devout faith or a woman of good character having intensively cultivated the intention to attain enlightenment. Repeat the essence of the Vajra Guru Mantra a hundred times, a thousand, or ten thousand, or a hundred thousand, or a million, or a hundred million times, as many times as possible. The resulting power and benefits shall be inconceivable, inconceivable to the human mind. And in all the directions of space, disease, poverty, warfare, hostile armies, civil strife, famine, dire prophecies, and ill omens, all these evils shall be averted if you give Padma Sambhava's mantra. As with all mantras, each word of the golden mantra has a special significance that goes beyond the literal translation. Therefore, the mantra can be interpreted and practiced on many levels. Remember that when you understand the profound meaning of the mantra, you are endowing it with your own sacred fire and directing what you hold in mind as your concept of the mantra to the entire universe. Dilgo Kensei says, this mantra is the life and heart, the quintessence of Guru Rinpoche. It is in fact Guru Rinpoche in the form of sound. The mantra is Padmasambhava. The lotus-born guru and his mantra are inseparable. When we utter his mantra, which includes the name of the guru, it is like repeatedly calling on someone whose response is unfailing. If we pray reciting his mantra one-pointedly, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Guru Rinpoche will turn his compassion toward us and grant his blessings. On another level of meaning, the first three syllables of the mantra, Om Ah Hum, are three bija, or seed syllables, that enable one to traverse three planes of consciousness, the universal, the ideal, and the individual, symbolized in the Dharmakaya, the Sambhokaya, and Nirmanakaya. Om signifies the point of origin, your point of origin in Brahman, the essence and universality of the Dharmakaya. Ah is for the experience of inspiration or inspirational delight through the Sambhogkaya, through your Holy Christ Self. Hum represents expression and spiritual realization at the level of the Nirmanakaya, the body of the saint. According to the esoteric Buddhist teaching, the disciple's invocation of the seed syllables, Om, Ah, Hum, releases the light and energy necessary for the eradication of all wrongs ever done through his body, speech, or mind. This is the great qualification of seed syllables that traditions of Hinduism give us. This light and energy also transfer to him the qualities and blessings of the body, speech, and mind of the Buddhas or of one's guru. In the case of the Vajra Guru Mantra, the devotee's goal is to have his body, speech, and mind become one with the body, speech, and mind of Padma Sambhava. He the plus, we the minus. He the masculine, we the feminine, he the spirit universe that we desire to have converge with our matter universe, our body. When we give the mantra, it is the way through the Divine Mother that all beings of light in the spirit cosmos can converge at this point of our physicality. They literally place their electronic presence, a duplicate or a double of themselves, over us. So you can see yourself standing inside a great, big, wonderful Padmasambhava. 
The word Vajra in this mantra signifies the union of the Dharmakaya, Sambhokaya, and Nirmanakaya. It means diamond, adamantine, or thunderbolt. Dilgo Kense explains its significance. Vajra indicates absolute mastery or realization of the indivisibility of the three kayas, the three bodies. Vajra, 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 Vajra. Do you see how I'm releasing the sound without actually saying it? I'm using the power of the breath and simply form, forming my lips. It's coming from deep within my chakras. See if you can feel the fire of it. Vajra, 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 Vajra. It sounds like, and it is what it is. It's a thunderbolt. Buddhists believe that Padmasambhava's mantra has the power to vanquish the five poisons, which are the antithesis of the wisdoms of the Dhyani Buddhas. The devotee seeks to be conferred with these wisdoms because they will give him the ability to transmute the five poisons. The five poisons are the obstacles to his spiritual progress and to his realization of Buddhahood. The word Vajra represents mirror-like wisdom, the wisdom of the Dhyani Buddha, Akshobhya. Akshobhya, mirror-like wisdom allows one to see all things in their true nature and reflects all things uncritically and calmly. Akshobhya's mirror-like wisdom overcomes the poison of anger, hate, and hate creation. The word guru represents the wisdom of equality. Om, ah, hum, vajra, guru. The word guru in the mantra represents the wisdom of equality or inner wisdom. The wisdom of the Dhyani Buddha, Ratna Sambhava. The non-egoistic wisdom of equality embodies the principle of the solidarity of all beings as it sees all things with divine impartiality. Ratna Sambhava's wisdom of equality vanquishes the poison of spiritual, intellectual, and human pride. The word Padma, Padma, symbolizes fearless compassion, discriminating wisdom, the wisdom of the Dhyani Buddha, Amitabha, Amitabha. Discriminating wisdom confers inner vision and spiritual discernment, separating inordinate desire from ordinate desire. It is called the wisdom of clear sight that can perceive the causes of karmic conditions and therefore make the choice to no longer engage in those causes. Amitabha's wisdom of equality conquers the poisons of the passions, all cravings, covetousness, greed, and lust. City. City, city, represents all accomplishing wisdom or wisdom that accomplishes all works. The wisdom of the Dhyani Buddha, Amoga City, Amoga City. Cities are powers or abilities acquired through the practice of yoga, the four kinds of yoga we discussed in our lecture on Hinduism. The supreme city is enlightenment. Amoga City's all accomplishing wisdom transmutes the poisons of envy and jealousy. Hum, hum, hum. This is the final syllable of the mantra. In some interpretations, it signifies the wisdom of the Dharma Datu, the wisdom of the Dhyani Buddha Vairoshana, which consumes the poison of ignorance. In Tibetan Buddhism, hum is rich in symbolic meaning. It anchors the mantra in the human heart, sheltering it and bringing it to maturity. Lama Govinda writes, 
Om is like the sun, but whom is like the soil into which the sun's rays must descend in order to awaken dormant life. Lama Govinda explains that after the disciple has experienced universal consciousness, he returns to the human plane on which all attainments are translated into life and deed. The place of this experience is the human heart in which the diamond being Vajrasattva is realized and becomes an ever-present force in the seed syllable hum. The Ascended Masters teach that Vajrasattva's diamond will of God counteracts the poisons of non-will and non-being, fear, doubt, and non-belief in God, the great guru. Padmasambhava's wisdom of resolution and world transmutation vanquishes world chaos created by the poisons delivered by the four horsemen of the apocalypse. On July 5th, 1989, the Ascended Lady Master, the Goddess of Liberty, gave us a visualization that you may very well wish to use while giving Padmasambhava's mantra. The visualization is for the transmutation of the five poisons and for the recreation of yourself in the image and likeness of the Buddha. This is what she said. You may observe and you may call to your Holy Christ self and to your inner Buddha to show you where those poisons are present and how you can root them out and replace them with a glorious image of the golden Buddha. Wherever you see corruption in the self or another, replace it with a glorious image of the golden Buddha. And see that Buddha smiling back at you out of that person, out of the chakras, the self, or the consciousness. Whatever you see that is imperfect in another or yourself, beloved, whenever you see it, see the golden Buddha blazing. See the golden Buddha blazing. And there you will have the response of the golden Buddha blazing back at you. You will see the transformation and you will see the Buddha step out of that one to initiate you, to embrace you, to place upon your head the crown of everlasting life. Physicians, one and all, heal thyself. The Buddha is the great physician that does heal thee. Become the Buddha. Enter the Buddha. Let the Buddha enter thy heart. Heal thyself. Let us give the mantra once.
This concludes our lecture on the Divine Mother. For more information on the mystical paths of the world's religions, call toll-free 1-800-323-5228. The preceding program was presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047-5000. If you'd like to know more, call this number or write this address. For your free copy of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's best-selling book, The Human Aura, call this toll-free number, 1-800-323-5228. This is a limited-time offer, so call now for your free book. That's 1-800-323-5228.